I want to start off like I frequently do on some of the, our conversations and ask you a question. As a float center owner or operator or manager, Clicker works, what is your most important job? Pause. Safety. There is no secondary responsibility. There is no tertiary responsibility. If you are not managing safety, you should not be in business. It is that primary to our existence. But let's talk about facility design and how we manage safety, and let's work our way through some of the questions that we all need to address. Frequently, we see people confusing float tanks and special purpose swimming pools. Are there differences? What are they? If they are different, are hazards different between these types of venues? If we have learned anything in our 50 plus years of operating public pools according to our current modern standards, what can we apply to best management practices in float tanks? And if there are gaps, how do we go about filling those gaps so that we can develop best practices for that primary responsibility of maintaining health and safety? The bottom line is if we use a risk management approach where we have identified the hazards and then we've ex uh, identified the exposure patterns, we have a scientifically based risk management program. So we need to start off with a base. And the biggest base that we have is pools and spas. Hot tubs is probably the preferred terminology these days. I tend to slip back and forth between spas and hot tubs. And some industries don't like to be called spas. Some, yeah, it's a jargon and a marketing issue. It's beyond my level of concern. But there are two data sets that we need to be aware of when we're dealing with pools and spas. There's the historical database going back to 1978 with the CDC where periodically they've reported the number of disease outbreaks, what organisms were involved, and how they occurred. This is all available on the CDC website. It's in peer-reviewed publications, frequently a lovely journal called Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. If not in there, it's in infectious, uh, emerging infectious diseases, excellent journals to read. All right, so we have data there, but then this summer, just before the 4th of July, a new set of data came out where instead of using outbreak data, they went into the medical uh, industry where they're using ICD data for all health centers. And we, so we've, composit we've composited these two sets. We know what organisms cause what diseases in what pool or hot tub. We have a huge database. And this is what it looks like. This chart describes 99.9% of the disease-causing organisms in pools and spas. This chart is extremely well understood, and the CDC agrees because this is their data. But now, let's look at float tanks. We don't have a very extensive database on float tanks. There's some older data, but nobody's really done a huge study on it. There are three recent outbreaks that I would like to point out, uh, Norway, British Columbia, and Ontario. When we look at all of those, they had a management pro a program where they were using less 
than the specified level of magnesium sulfate in the FDA North American float tank standard. They were using about 20%. People might have been able to float, but it is not the standard practice. When we look at the data according to float tanks that are operated according to your practices, there's no outbreaks, period. Okay, let's do a comparison between these three types of venues, and they are different based upon the exposure pattern. Well, the first thing is how people interact, the amount of water. But there's a huge difference that some health departments don't understand. In a pool or a spa, hot tub, if the pump is not running, when it is in use, that is a cause for immediate closure. I mean immediate. You blow the whistle, you get everybody out, you padlock the gate until that pump works. You don't run a pump while the float tank is operated under any circumstances. We'll talk about that in detail later. But then there's a little difference in the salt concentration between pools and float tanks. I half of about half of my pools that I operate in the Atlanta area are salt water pools. They have between 2800 and 3600 ppm of sodium chloride. About 3000 how much do you have? 300,000. All right, you can swallow pool water. If it's well-maintained, it's potable. You can swallow hot tub water. If it's well-maintained, it would be considered potable. I don't recommend you do either one. If someone is arguing about whether you're going to swallow float tank solution, it is not water. Right? But if someone is arguing that you're going to swallow 30 mils of float tank solution, which is the calculated, scientifically measured amount that the average swimming pool user swallows in one 30 minute period, 30 mils, one gulpful. I want you to hand them a cup of float tank solution. I want you to have them take their little finger, stick that in there, and stick that on the tip of their tongue, and ask them if they would like to swallow the rest of the cup. When we consider how people interact with the solution, whether or not you have respirating aerosol-generating devices like on a hot tub, we can say scientifically your only route of exposure to a germ in a float tank solution is going to be from your skin. This is what this bottom line says. That is the paper analysis. We're going to get to the science in just a little bit. But, so this is the paper analysis. You've seen me do this before. You've also seen this slide before. We have only been using concentrations of salt to preserve food for a few years, like 5,000 years. Every general microbiology textbook explains how concentrations of solids or salts inhibits microbial growth. And there is a certain level of salt that inhibits the growth for various organisms. This is well-known science. It's in every micro book. It's detailed in every microbial physiology book. It's known. So when we apply that information to this, now we can say, okay, there shouldn't be anything in concern. Okay. This is science. Prove it. So that is why the Flotation Tank Association has undertaken a scientific study to see if this theory is supportable by data. So we start off and we use, what methods are we going to use? So how do you do a field study? 
the most appropriate guideline is the US EPA OCS PP 810 2600. If I want to register a new chlorine source for a swimming pool, I use 810-2600. It tells me how many samples to get, when to get them, how to measure them, how to report the data. I have done this protocol in my industrial life several dozen times. And the methods we use are out of a really exciting book called Standard Methods for the Examination of Water and Wastewater. These methods are standardized. They are accepted by every microbiology lab that does microbiology. That picture on the right is the bookshelf out of my office. So not only do I have the current versions, I have the previous version so I can look at the historical records and see how we have changed the methods. So now we know how many samples we're gonna get, how we're gonna get, and we open the book and then we collect these are the methods that we use, SM9213E. Uh, These are the methods. Every laboratory has this book that can do microbiology. Then we set up a, a study. You saw us do this a couple years ago. Uh, Graham and Ashcon came up on the stage when we selected, when we requested help. We asked for help. A number of centers say, just collect some data, I'll help you find a lab, you submit it to the lab using the standard chains of custody, which are required for environmental samples, the laboratory accepts it, that lab is a certified laboratory under the NELAC system, you identify them through the TNI website, they analyze it using standard methods for the examination of water, they submit that data back to the laboratory, that laboratory then sends me the PDF. I look at it. The labs we used are, uh, the uh, float centers we used, oh, I promised you we would keep this confidential. No float center knows who else is in the study. As a matter of fact, these labs did not know enough science to even understand what the report said. I was frequently getting emails at nine or 10 o'clock at night when they would get a result and it's like they didn't know what column to look in and I would have to get up and write a quick email back. It's like, it means you're fine. They did not know how to bias the sampling because they didn't understand how to, they couldn't have spiked the samples nor could they have arbitrarily collected them because they didn't understand the, how the science worked. It's called blind science. These are real world samples. All right, 463 separate samples, 130 pseudomonas, 91 heterotrophic plate counts, E. coli, fecal coliforms, and total coliforms are all basically about the same, it's different categories, uh, and a bunch of staff. That's a bunch of microbiology samples. What did we find for the average? No pseudomonas, a few heterotrophs, no E. coli, no fecals, no, pretty darn clean. But the question is, how many of them passed the guidelines that would have been acceptable under US EPA OCS PP 810-2600. Under the federal guideline, you can have a 15% failure rate. So on a test, you'd get an 85 and you would pass. If you got an 84, you would fail. So there is a certain amount of wiggle room that you have on a test. And so this is expressed a little different. So it's like the numbers you're gonna see on the next slide is the number of failures, okay? the number of failures that exceeded the safe guidelines. Zero. Let me repeat that. I found zero samples out of 463 that indicated a potential for health hazard. Let's look at these separately. Heterotrophs, that's just a general category. It's like, 
I counted all you up. That'd be the heterotrophs. That wasn't, there could be blondes, there could be blue head, uh, uh, blue eyes, there could be freckles, you know, it could be people with mismatching socks. So it's a category that would count all of you would be a heterotroph in this case. And so there was one laboratory that found a few heterotrophs. And this laboratory coordinated very closely with the, uh, with the, uh, the lab, this float center coordinated with the laboratory. They sampled at 10 o'clock right after a float, got in the car, immediately drove to the laboratory, delivered the sample, they analyzed it as soon as they received it, and the manager of the float center immediately went to lunch. So the sampling period was after use, convenient for him so he could get to lunch. But immediately after use, the fastest sample you could get, the maximum number was less than 25% of the limit. If he would have sampled in the afternoon like several of the other float centers did, the bacteria would have died off. So these are transitory populations that just haven't died yet. But this proves how good that sampling routine was. This validated the approach. All right, coliforms, E. coli, the ones that cause massive diarrhea. I don't care what category you looked at, we didn't find one of them. You know why? Float customers take a shower with soap. The average adult human carries 0.14 gram of feces on their backsides. This tells you your users are actually using soap. Okay, Pseudomonas. We found a few Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, the primary cause of dermal infection. Pseudomonas folliculitis is the most common uh, disease in swimming pools and spas, causing up to 80% of all inferior, inferior, ear infections. The average we found was 3.75. CFU per 100 mils. That ain't very many. This is well below the level of concern. Some jurisdictions try to say it's zero because they're using a uh, ingestion model. Pseudomonas doesn't cause a uh, gastrointestinal illness. It causes a skin infection. Other studies say you need to be at least 1,000, if not 100,000, to have a disease-causing potential. One center found a bunch. I suspect that what you're picking up is pseudomonas from the shower floor and somebody transferring it in or contamination during sampling. There is an NSF international study that says 99.9% .9 of pseudomonas will die within 24 hours when it's exposed. This again shows that a rapid sampling can detect something. This again validates how sampling can work. It is below the level of concern. It does exist, but NSF separate study verifies it cannot grow in a well-maintained system. Last organism we talk about is Staphylococcus. 5% of all adults carry Staphylococcus aureus, either on their no in their nose or on their skin. It is incredibly salt resistant. I expected to find it. I can find it in every high school pool I've ever tested. Didn't find it in float solution. Probably because your customers are using soap when they take a shower. Okay, what does it mean? This study relied upon 
the most current understanding of recreational water illnesses, which is what we describe things, even though float solutions should not be considered recreational water illness. It is a separate category, but the type of germ is called an RWI. So it is the most current understanding of all pathogens that may occur in a similar venue. The safety requirements that, uh, that we've shown here are greatly in excess of those mandated by the US EPA for swimming pools. It is safer than a well-managed swimming pool. It is the most extensive study on float tanks. And I would like to emphasize this next point. It is among the top 10 most detailed studies on swimming pools connected in the modern age. And it is more comprehensive than any known study on hot tubs. Conclusions. The total of 155 samples were collected and produced a grand total of 463 separate microbiological samples. No single sample exceeded the maximum permissible level for coliforms, fecal coliforms, or E. coli, and that is the indication of good sanitation. A few samples did contain Pseudomonas aeruginosa. They were at a minimum of 1,000 times lower than the level of concern. When float tanks are operated according to the FDA North American float tank standard, the microbial health risk from bacteria in float solution is comparable to that of a well-maintained swimming pool and is substantially better than hot tubs. That is a very conservative statement to describe how safe it is. All right, conflicts of interest. I have not received any compensation for this. I do not want any compensation for this work. I do not own a float center. I will never own a float center because I want my weekends off. The next statement has a legal term in it and I will read it verbatim. To a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, that's the phrase. Float tanks are a unique venue and must not be classified, treated, and operated as special purpose swimming pools. The scientific opinions expressed herein are in agreement with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention because I know people at the CDC that float. Next steps, we've got to get it published. The lead author will be Dr. Laura Supis, University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire. She is well known to the CDC, and worked with her repeatedly. She, uh, so she's involved in it. She is also a senior instructor trainer for the CPO course along with me. We don't have time for additional questions today. We'll run some round tables from the FTA. Watch out for email. And if you want to read some boring stuff, there's the references. Thank you.